So we have some upcoming holiday events at, at the fort location through Tesoro in November. We have our second lecture, which is um, the night the stars fell, and that's November 15th. It's a dinner lecture at the Fort Restaurant. Tickets are still available for that. If you would like to come, then you can contact us either online or by telephone. It's information right out front. Then we have our annual Farolito lighting and pine cone ceremony on Sunday, November 29th. This is a really special event. It's a free event. Um, we invite people to come and they sing some songs, some kind of pre-Christmas, get us in the, in the Christmas, the holiday season, singing some carols. There's hot chocolate and cookies and everybody can write the name of somebody that they're, they would like to honor or remember and put it inside a pine cone. And then we have a beautiful fire set in the courtyard and as people go through a procession while they're caroling, they put their pine cone in the fire and send all the good hopes up to the skies. So it's a special, it's only an hour and a half ceremony, but it's really nice. Oh, did we get it? No. We got it, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Something about wireless, a wire connector would be good. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege to share this, this, uh, this most American of stories with you. Some of you actually may feel a little bit disconcerted as you look at the title of my lecture because you're not quite sure who the Mandan Indians are. Uh, Mandan or Nueta does not have the familiar ring of Cherokee or Narragansett or Comanche or Seminole. But I want to put you at ease because, in fact, you do know about the Mandans. And the reason you know about them is that the explorers Meriwether Lewis and William Clark and their so-called Corps of Discovery spent the winter of 1804-1805 among the Mandans on the outbound portion of their famous transcontinental journey. So the Mandans were Earth Lodge dwellers uh, who live on the Missouri River in the middle of what is now known as North Dakota. What I'm going to do today is use the tools of environmental history to examine what happened on the Upper Missouri River between the year 1500 and 1838. So in these years, the Mandans faced an unprecedented series of ecological challenges. Many, although not all, of these challenges related in some way to the arrival of new peoples and species on the North American continent. So the Mandans and their ancestors had made their homes at what they called the heart of the world, which is the confluence of the Heart River flowing in from the west with the Missouri River. They made their homes in this area since around the year 13. Now, many peoples use similar designations for their homelands, uh, but in the case of the Mandans, this name, the heart of the world, is particularly appropriate. The heart of the world was less than a hundred miles from the geographic center of the North American continent. The Mandans also occupied a distinctive ecological niche. They were farmers. They grew corn in tremendous quantities despite living at the northern limit of maize cultivation and despite living beyond the 100th meridian, which was the widely accepted western boundary of non-irrigated agriculture. Now the Mandans also harvested meat, especially bison, to complement the grain and vegetable yield of their gardens. In the summer, they killed these animals on the grasslands that extended in all directions around their towns. And in the winter, when weather often drove people and bison alike into the sheltered river bottoms, they hunted in the river bottom forest from which these animals barely budged before temperatures warmed in the spring. 
And then in the spring, the Mandans harvested delectable float bison. Float bison were seasoned, drowned animals that drifted by their towns when the river ice broke up. Um, and if you think, you know, you think fermented meat is an odd uh, taste, if you've eaten salami, you've eaten fermented meat, okay? <laughs> so the villagers also acquired bison products by trading with itinerant visitors, offering them handicrafts, farm stuffs, and other items in return for, for meat and hides and other, uh, other bison produce. Now, bison aside, you might think that the Mandan's reliance on agriculture in land of sparse rain, intense cold, and short growing seasons, you might think this was a tenuous choice. But the villagers found security, or at least food security, through diversification. To accommodate a growing season, typically fewer than 130 days long, Mandan women cultivated at least nine and possibly as many as 14 different varieties of maize. And these different varieties serve different horticultural, culinary, nutritional, and ceremonial purposes. The different varieties also ripened at different speeds and under different conditions. Now, that typically took between 90 to 125 days to ripen. And so what happened is that by, by making successive plantings to take advantage of different varietal traits, Indian women, who did the farming, Indian women ensured that a rogue frost did not destroy the whole crop. Now, rainfall also posed a challenge. Average rainfall in this region today is, is something like 17 inches per year. And one of the ways that Mandan women accommodated this was by planting in the river bottoms, where capillary action pulled moisture upward to thirsty roots in all but the driest of seasons. Now, of course, there were times when the rains failed. Uh, there were times when ears of corn shriveled on the stalk. But when this happened, the villagers, or more particularly village women, had a backup plan. They turned to vast stores of dried maize, beans, squash, sunflower seeds, Vast stores that they kept on hand for trade, for winter consumption, and for emergencies. Archaeologists have tallied up almost 70,000 bushels of underground storage capacity in the cash pits at a single village. This is the early Mandan or pre-Mandan town known as Huff. Now, I grew up in New Jersey, mostly. I'm from North Carolina, but I spent my childhood in, in New Jersey. So, like, bushels weren't really a part of my world. <laughs> um, I had to look up, you know, so what's it mean, 70,000 bushels? Well, as a benchmark, a bushel is eight gallons of capacity. <laughs> One bushel of dried shelled maize weighs 56 pounds. So think about 70,000 bushels. And the villagers may not have used all this capacity at once, but the Huff village site was only occupied for about 20 years. So the extent of these food stores for consumption and for trade alike is truly mind-boggling. Now the Mandans did have periods of hardship in which meat in particular was hard to come by. But full-fledged famine appears to have been rare. And in fact, it was so rare that a Mandan winter count keeper, a man named Butterfly, recalled the winter of 1866. It's relatively late. He recalled the winter of 1866 as our first famine. 
This was the first time our people ever went hungry, having neither corn nor meat. Now, as, as you're going to see today, uh, other evidence suggests that this was not entirely correct, but Butterfly's point is well taken. The Mandan Lifeway accommodated the unpredictability of North Dakota's climate in all but the most dire circumstances. And 21st century archaeology has begun to reveal the extent of the Mandan's success. High-tech imaging of sites in the Heart River area has shown that several towns were major population centers. Double Ditch Village, just north of Bismarck, North Dakota, may be the most spectacular and accessible example. And the town's name reflects its most, most striking visible feature, uh, these two clearly discernible fortification trenches that still delineate former boundaries of this palisaded town. So when you imagine Double Ditch, imagine those trenches now, if you were to walk over this terrain, they'd just be uh, eight inches, 10 inches deep, and, and they look rather small, certainly not a formidable obstacle. But imagine them before they collapsed and filled in, being six, seven feet deep, 12 or 14 inches wide. This was a veritable moat, backed up by a palisade of sharpened stakes. But it turns out that the name Double Ditch is misleading. What appears to be the outermost trench does not mark the outermost boundary of the town. Scans completed in 2004 revealed two additional trenches beyond the two visible ones for a total of four. In its spatial dimensions, Double Ditch was thus once much larger than scholars had recognized. So if you're looking at this image, you see here's the innermost trench, here's the next one, and then up here is a third one, and finally a fourth one with bastions, um, detectable only by magnetic radiometry, ground penetrating radar, electrical soil resistance testing, and these other non-invasive techniques. So it means that the two visible trenches represent only the town's smaller size as it pulled back in successive contractions. A survey suggests that another nearby town, a town called Larson, uh, also had two additional fortification trenches detectable primarily through magnetic radiometry. So, like Double Ditch, Larson was also much larger than scholars had imagined. And these patterns of expansion and contraction differ from village to village. And I'm sure that future scholars will add new discoveries. I'm sure they're going to surprise us again. For now, however, it's clear that the Mandans, in, in their heyday, lived in as many as 21 different villages near the Missouri Heart River confluence. Some of these villages had very brief occupations, but at least six were so-called traditional villages. These are very large, fortified settlements that lasted into the 18th century, that lasted into the 1700s. Now, how many people lived here? It's a very important and also very complicated question. And to be sure, we need more archeology span to help us sort this out. Nevertheless, it seems likely that the Mandans at the Heart River towns numbered, numbered as many as 12 to 15,000 at their pinnacle, which would, would have been perhaps in the early to mid 1500s. And then in the late 1500s, something happened. What follows is a blend of hypothesis and fact. The work coming out of Double Ditch suggests that that outermost ditch is the oldest, representing this town size, about 19 acres, at its founding, which was about the time Columbus sailed. But in the late 1500s, the villagers apparently abandoned the outer two ditches. The town shrank to 15 acres, roughly 20% reduction in size. So they contracted, in other, in other words, into the confines of the outermost 
of the two ditches that our eyes can discern today. So why did this happen? What, what caused Double Ditch, as well as Larson and possibly other nearby towns, what caused these towns to dwindle in size in the late 1500s? Well, we could, we could brainstorm, we could speculate. Um, you know, sanitation might have become a problem as population densities increased. We know this happened in European market towns. You know, um, and, and, and in the Middle Ages, some of them were infested with disease as a consequence. Another possibility is that Mandan numbers may have uh, overwhelmed the carrying capacity of the land that they occupied. Ecologists of the late 20th, early 21st centuries have recognized that carrying capacity is fluid. It depends on variables that change over time. You know, examples of such variables might include climate change, uh, pests that might have undermined the ability of Vandans to sustain themselves in their traditional fashion. Drought, in particular, was widespread in the 1500s. And a recently recognized mega drought afflicted much of North America and even Mexico with conditions far worse than the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And as you can see, it hit the upper Missouri area with particular force between 1574 and 1609. I think we need to be we need to be nimble in our in our thinking about this. You know, even if the Mandans had enough food to sustain themselves through these hard years, drought may have made them the targets of raids by other people who were hungry. Yeah. Think about it with, with their permanent locations, with their abundant food supplies, Mandan towns were always tempting targets. And the very fact that fortifications surrounded the towns indicates that some kind of external threat existed in the period that we're talking about. Now, other hazards of drought include grasshoppers, and still the bane of prairie farmers today. Grasshoppers proliferate in dry conditions. One 21st century uh, appraisal warns farmers that Grasshopper populations can double, triple, or quadruple with each successive year of drought. And here we're talking about many successive years. Another possible cause of population collapse is not pests, but pestilence. There is actually speculation that indigenous hantavirus carried by rodent vectors may have caused widespread human mortality in these years. Hantavirus is car carried by, by deer mice. We know about deer mice in Colorado. Uh, although hunt hantavirus itself was only identified in 1993, uh, but we now know that it, it has existed for much, much longer than that. And it does exist in North Dakota. Uh, drought conditions typically expedite its spread. Now, personally, I don't think that this, that, that hantavirus is a very likely cause of the depopulation that we are talking about today. But infectious disease still may have been the culprit. Wave after wave of sickness swept Mexico in the aftermath of Hernan Cortez's smallpox assisted conquest of the Mexica or Aztec people in 1521. There were at least 10 severe epidemics uh, from 1531 to 1595. Uh, that doesn't even include that famous initial smallpox epidemic that accompanied Cortez. And there's no doubt that smallpox and measles, these two, two old world viruses, two, two viruses from Europe, Africa, and Asia, right? There's no doubt the smallpox and measles were among these early outbreaks. These are, these are new species to the Americas. These are species that had a dramatic effect on America's native populations. So the question is whether any of these contagions reached the upper Missouri River during the 1500s. 
the, popula the, the, the possibility is strongest for infections like measles and smallpox. These are infections that have long incubation periods. Think about the way infections work. Think about you know, when you get a cold or something. An extended incubation period promotes the spread of contagion by allowing infected individuals to travel long distances before falling sick. So let's think about all this as it relates to the man bands. The population of Double Ditch appears to have collapsed just before 1600. Think how early this is. Jamestown in Virginia hasn't been established. Santa Fe hasn't been established. Quebec hasn't been established. Right? So the population of Double Ditch appears to have collapsed just before 1600. The first European trade items, sparse handful of glass beads and iron implements, reached the Mandans right around the same time. Logic suggests that new trade items and new contagions might have arrived together. Timing is obviously close, but we can't tell for certain that epidemic disease caused or contributed to the population collapse at Double Ditch and other Mandan towns just before 1600. But it is certainly possible and I think highly likely. Now uncertainty dissipates with the passage of time. By the early 1700s, Plains life was in upheaval again due to the arrival of the horse. Uh, horse was another new species, or sort of new, since horses had you know, originated in the Americas and then they disappeared at the end of the Pleistocene approximately 11,000 years ago, uh, but then they were reintroduced by Europeans. So Plains people embraced these animals after New Mexico's Pueblo Revolt of 1680 made them more widely accessible. <coughs> and horses spread northward over the course of the 1600s. The Mandans probably got their first horses around the year 1740. Might have been a couple of years earlier. Um, certainly they had seen horses earlier, but they appear to have gotten the first horses around the year 1740. But Plains equestrianism, itinerant equestrianism, did not become a way of life for the Mandans as it did for so many Plains peoples. Uh, did not become a way of life like as it did for the Lakota Sioux, eventually for the Cheyennes, for the Arapahoes, the Kiowas, uh, the Comanches. Uh, it still did change things. It changed gender roles, it changed work assignments, it changed warfare, it changed uh, the nature of wealth and its accumulation. It changed living arrangements and most obviously it changed travel and commerce. And commerce, trade, was the very center of Mandan life. Those Heart River towns were essentially a giant permanent rendezvous site. Yeah, think, think Mall of America here, but with a fabulously rich social and cultural life to boot. Uh, and horses meant easier, more frequent interaction between peoples than ever before. And horses also carried or hauled much more than dogs or humans ever could. Horses carried trade items, food, teepees, but their riders also carried invisible cargoes. Things like news, information, cultural knowledge, and sometimes microbes. Now, obviously information is a coveted commodity. Microbes are not. So whether or not new diseases had struck the Mandans and caused the great collapse of the pedestrian era of the late 1500s, we know they did so in the equestrian era of the 1700s and 1800s. Smallpox or some other infection afflicted Northern Plains peoples in the 1730s, 
And among those who suffered were the Lakota Sioux. Uh, the Lakota Sioux were people who raided and traded among the upper Missouri villagers. And a Lakota winter camp recalls 1734. A, a winter camp was a, a way of keeping track of, of people's history. You'd mark each winter with a significant event, a pictograph of a significant event. So Lakota winter camp uh, recalls 1734, 1735, as smallpox used them up with belly ache winter and marks the year's passage with a figure bearing two distinctive features. First, this midsection spiral, indicating abdominal distress. And second, an overlay, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a black and white image, but it's an overlay of red dots, like those used to designate a smallpox rash. And since vomiting is a classic early indicator of smallpox, the picture symptoms taken together make it quite likely that smallpox was in fact the pestilence of the 1730s. Now if the infection reached the Sioux and probably the Arikara people downstream from the Mandans, did it also reach the Mandans? No written or oral accounts of this outbreak survive. Where else can we look? Well the telltale evidence may well lie buried in ghost towns like Larson and Doubleditch. Remember, by 1600 or so, the Mandans at Doubleditch had ensconced themselves behind their second fortification ring, which we can still see today. But at some point, the villagers contracted again, taking shelter behind the innermost ditch and palisade. And the cause may well have been that epidemic of 1734-35. Now, regardless of exactly how and when it happened, we do know that Mandan towns like Double Ditch and Larson had suffered stunning population loss by the middle of the 1700s, by which time they were ensconced behind that innermost fortification ditch. So, Double Ditch, around the year 1500, it contained 160 homes and roughly 2,000 people. By the mid 1700s, it appears to have been 80% smaller, with 32 homes and no more than 400 people hunkered down inside the smallest ditch that you see here. And then disaster struck again. In 1781, Smallpox made its way to the upper Missouri River from Spanish settlements to the south. The precise route that it followed is not clear, but fleet-footed horses made its transit easy. Comanches, Pawnees, Arikaras, Shoshones, Dakotas, Blackfeet, Crees, Hidatsas, Mandans, everyone contracted this infection. Among the Mandans, it undermined families, age group societies, clan and bundle lines. Of 13 clans, only six survived. The Mandans reeled, and their enemies, with whom they alternately raided and traded, the Lakota Sioux, closed in. With their population depleted and the threat of violence apparently growing, the Mandans sought safety in numbers. And they accomplished this by moving 40 or 50 miles north and living cheek by jowl beside their Hidatsa neighbors at the confluence of the Knife River and the Missouri. And the Heart River villages, once the home to thousands of people, were now ghost towns. When Lewis and Clark passed through. 23 years after that epidemic, Clark marked the empty town sites on his maps. Old Indian village killed by the Sioux, designated Double Ditch. Now, I wish we knew more about Mandan efforts to reconstitute their lives in the aftermath of this episode. We do know that at, the, at, at on a slant village, a venerable chief named Good Boy rallied all the Mandans who lived on the west bank of the Missouri River and all the west side towns consolidated into a single new one. 
just below the Hidatsas. The East Bank Mandans, they were known as the Nuktadis, uh, including those at Double Ditch and Larson, did essentially the same thing. Settlement upstream on their own side of the river. So essentially, the Mandans and the Hidatsas, the Hidatsas are their neighbors to the north, went from moving in a configuration of towns that looked like this to a configuration of towns that looked like this. By 1797, the Mandans lived in two Missouri River towns, one on the east bank and one on the west, near the mouth of the Knife River. The Mandans by this time numbered roughly 1,500 people in all. And remember, there may have been 15,000 a century and a half earlier, or two and a half centuries earlier. The, the Mandan migration to the Knife River coincided with a growing European-American presence on the Northern Plains. And with it came a burgeoning written record as travelers such as David Thompson, Lewis and Clark, George Catlin, uh, Prince Maximilian, Carl Bodmer, and scores of less famous tourists and traders spent time in the Knife River villages. Their writings and their images reveal much of what followed foreign diseases, now easier to identify, swirled across the plains. Whooping cough coursed through the villages in the summer of 1806, uh, it filling the air with, with hacking coughs and that, that desperate whistle-like wheezing that gives the infection its name. Uh, whooping cough may have struck again in 1813 and 14, and whooping cough definitely struck the Mandans again five years later, this time in tandem with measles. These twin infections, according to the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, first showed themselves at the Mandan villages and have from them spread all over the country. So, you know, as focal points of commerce, the Mandan villages were also focal points of contagion. And reports of infection are abundant for the Assiniboines, the Sioux, and other nearby peoples who traded and raided uh, with the villagers. Now, more challenges came quickly as the St. Louis fur trade extended its reach northward. Now, I mentioned deer mice earlier. Uh, as possible carriers of hantavirus. Deer mice were a constant problem in Mandan earth lodges. The re residents of the Mandan town of Mitatahankush complained that deer mice were very destructive and that they gnawed clothing and other manufacturers to pieces in a lamentable manner. But it's worth noting Despite Mandan complaints, deer mice rarely burrow. So they left the Mandan's underground grain caches alone. Well, in 1825, a visiting U.S. keelboat brought another new species to meet at the Hungers. This was a species that put the deer mouse in perspective. The new creature was the Norway rat, also called the brown rat, sewer rat, or wharf rat. Now, for the Mandans, the sight of a new creature was a momentous occasion, perhaps even a visitation of the spirits. The artist ethnographer George Catlin reported that hundreds came to watch and look at the strange animal. No one, he said, dared to kill it. And when the Indians saw a Norway rat devouring a deer mouse, they were delighted. Perhaps if these new creatures multiplied, they would rid their earth lodges of those bothersome deer mice. Perhaps the spirits had indeed intervened. Well, the rats did multiply, and quickly. I'm going to spare you the, the full details of rat reproduction that I learned in the course of this research, but I do want to share one item with you from the rat scholar, Jonathan Burt. Litters can be as large as 14, 
the generally average between six and eight, he writes. Females can be ready to mate as soon as 18 hours after giving birth, and their offspring are sexually mature by three months. Moreover, Norway rats are assiduous burrowers, spending much of their life beneath the surface of the earth. And this aspect of rat ecology combined with their prodigious reproductive rate to create dreadful consequences. The Mandan's underground brain caches were formidable constructions, but they were obviously underground, and they were no match for the rats. And with a seemingly bottomless storehouse of maize to consume, the rats burrowed and multiplied. George Catlin observed that within six years of the rat's arrival at Mitotahankush, the animals had infested every wigwam, and the Indians' caches, where they buried their corn and other provisions, he said, were robbed and sacked. So voracious were the rats that Earth Lodge floors buckled and collapsed, no longer supported by stores of grain below. Archaeologists have calculated that rat bones constitute 54% of all the micro-animal remains at a little place called Fort Clark, which was the American Fur Company post that sat beside me to the Hunkers. You can see the village here and here's Fort Clark. They're actually even closer together than that. Um, I don't think the person who did this map had ever really been on, on the site. They, you know, 54% of micro-animal remains at Fort Clark, this American Fur Company post, um, can be attributed to Norway rats. Now, the uh, American Fur Company trader who occupied Fort Clark was a, a sour guy named Chardon. Um, and Francis Chardon actually kept a journal, this gives you a sense of his personality, in which he recorded every time he killed a rat. And he tabulated. I just, I, so I just extracted some of his quotations here for you to give you a sense of how many rats there were at, at Fort Clark. Um, you can see it starts off in June of 1836, killed 82 rats this month, July 201, uh, and it keeps a running total, so that a year later, by May of 1837, he's killed a total of 1,686 rats in Fort Clark. Does it say how he was killing them? No, I didn't say. <laughs> now, in 1832, as the rats ran amok, a steamboat named Yellowstone churned up the Missouri River, docking below Mitotahankush in order to, to, to service Fort Clark. The Yellowstone was the first steamer to reach the Mandans, and like the other boats that followed, it had a voracious appetite, not for maize, but for wood. Now, Mandans consumed plenty of wood on their own, for fuel, for fortifications, for earth lodge construction, even at times actually for, for horse fodder. Steamboats, however, were in a different league. A small steamer, like the Yellowstone, needed 12 cords of wood. It's the equivalent of 60 10-inch trees for each day of travel. And these boats inevitably reloaded with wood at meet of the Hunkush. The German Prince Maximilian noted as early as 1833-34 that wood was in short supply near meet of the Hunkush. In the nearby forests, he observed only a very small quantity of useful timber is found. Now these dwindling forests had far-reaching effects. In the winter, the Mandans and the bison herds alike migrated to the Missouri River's forested bottomlands to escape the full force of the weather. For the Indians, this made for easy hunting and abundant meat in an otherwise difficult season. But now, with few trees, the river bottoms offered little shelter, and the winter bison herds went elsewhere. Mandan's starving 
A fort full of men, women, and children begging meat, wrote Francis Chardon on December 3rd, 1836. Chardon reported that there were plenty of bison 30 miles off on February 4th. Ten days later, same situation. Mandan's all starving, he wrote. Although cattle, by which he means bison, are within 30 miles of the fort. But this time, the, the trader added a key bit of information. Fear, he said, caused the, caused the Mandans to keep at home. In other words, fear kept them from going out and hunting those bison 30 miles away. Throughout the winter of 1836-1837, the Sioux, the Kota Sioux, hung close to meet the Hungush. And sightings of enemies came in regularly and sent ripples of panic through the Mandan towns. There was also a, there was Mita to Hankush, which was a big town, and then a little town called Muktadi, which was just upstream from Mita to Hankush. And in fact, the Sioux presence added to hunting pressure and frightened bison and villagers alike. So the Mandans thus faced a three-dimensional problem in the winter of 1836-37. Their corn was too meager. The rats were eating it. The Sioux were too close. And the bison were too far away. And then in April of 1837, two additional pressures came to bear. The first is a mystery. For some reason, the thawing Missouri River failed to yield up its annual supply of prized float bison, which is an important source of nourishment in the leanest of seasons in the spring. The Mandans have lost all hope of catching the drowned buffalo, wrote Chardon, as not one has passed this year. Second, the entire Arikara tribe, the Arikaras were people who lived to the south of the Mandans, Entire Arikara tribe, perhaps as many as 2,000 people, sought shelter with the Mandans after abandoning their own villages and testing nomadic life for a year. Now, these tribes, Arikaras and Mandans, were traditional enemies. But the Mandans offered the Arikaras temporary quarters, hoping that together they might fend off the Sioux. The net effect was still more strained on the Mandan's paltry food stores. The cruelest blow came two months later. On June 18, 1837, the fur company steamer St. Peter's landed at Mita the Hungush. On board were passengers, supplies, and the smallpox virus. And what followed is one of the most calamitous and oft recited episodes in the history of the American West, documented day by day in Francis Chardon's journal. 56 years had passed since 1781 when the last smallpox epidemic had struck the Mandans. What this meant was that no one but the elderly had acquired immunity. A young Mandan died today of the smallpox, Chardon wrote on July 14th, 1837. Several others have caught it. Thereafter, the pox ripped through both Mita the Hunkush and Niptati, that smaller town just upriver. In August of 1837, the Mandans, who could do so, abandoned Mita the Hunkush. The women scoured the town for orphans belonging to their clans, and then they fled, leaving all that were sick in the village to heal or die on their own. You can imagine what that decision must have been like. The villagers' departure was a desperate act of self-preservation. The Indians camped on the far side of the river until late September 1837, and then Chardon said the 41 survivors of Mita to Hankush left as the Arikara people took over their town and moved into their earth lodges. And in fact, the, the actual number of survivors was more like two, three hundred. So think about this. The year was 1837. The Mandans had lived through no more than a century and a half of direct contact with European newcomers. The famous Indian Wars of the West had barely begun. 
that famous phrase, manifest destiny, had yet to be coined. Railroads and white homesteaders had yet to arrive. There had been no violence between Mandans and European Americans. But events had already brought one of the great nations of the Great Plains to the brink of destruction. And they had survived. The resilience of the Mandans, who lived on, and still live in North Dakota today, by virtue of their toughness, their kindness, their openness, their wisdom, and their cultural and spiritual wealth, is an inspiration to us all. Thank you.